Thank you, Zamira. Uh, last week I was wearing a tie and collar because we crowned the king. Uh, this week, because we crowned the medical students yesterday. <laughs> so, uh, uh, do not expect a tie next week. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these remarkable accounts of Moses and Aaron and the people of Israel and Pharaoh. Thank you for what we can learn and take to heart. And Lord, we pray that you would apply these truths to our hearts so that our hearts would not become hard and that our ears would not become deaf and so that we would be able to hear you and respond with an open and full heart. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. So we're in the middle of a sermon series in the uh, book of Exodus, looking at the life of Moses. We're also keeping a keen eye on what this means for us as people... 3,400 years later and who have the benefit of understanding the Lord Jesus and his death and what that means. So the story so far is that Joseph, the saviour of Egypt, has died. He's long dead, 400 years have passed, Israel's or Jacob's children have prospered, they've been very fruitful, there's a lot of them, and they've become enslaved in Egypt. They're making bricks, building cities, cities that have lasted through the centuries, and they're still there, for those of you who've been to Egypt, you've seen the pyramids, you've seen the Sphinx, you've seen the, uh, the buildings that Pharaoh and Pharaoh's put up. Pharaoh thinks he's God. Pharaoh thinks his children will be God after him. Pharaoh has the serpent God, the snake, on his forehead. Moses was rescued from the River Nile. The Pharaoh at the time had demanded that all the baby boys were thrown into the Nile and indeed Moses was placed very carefully in an ark in the Nile, was found by Pharaoh's daughter and was adopted and brought up in Pharaoh's household. At around the age of 40, Pharaoh, uh, Moses made a somewhat pathetic attempt to free the Israelites by killing one slave driver and he had to fly, flee into the land of Midian uh, where he found a family of shepherds, seven daughters of one man called Jethro. He marries Jethro's daughter Zipporah and is looking after his father-in-law's sheep on the backside of the wilderness beyond the black stump, I think they call it, in Australia. And he was the wrong man in the wrong job, doing the wrong thing with the wrong people in the wrong place. And God met him and called out his name, Moses, Moses, in a burning bush. So Moses goes and has a look at the burning bush, and God reveals his plan, his power, and his person. God's plan is that Moses is going to go back to Egypt and redeem God's people out of slavery. God reveals his power by giving Moses special abilities. God reveals his person in the name of I am that I am. That's what God reveals. Moses reveals his sense of identity crisis and his insecurity. Moses, Moses reveals by saying, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Who am I? Israel will not listen to me. Who am I? I can't talk. 
I don't want to talk. I don't want to go. Send someone else. Well, God and Moses have a frank and full exchange and uh, Moses eventually agrees and goes back to his father-in-law Jethro and asks for permission to take his wife and family back to Egypt with him and do the job. Last week we looked at how God met him on the way and God sought to put Moses to death and how Zipporah circumcised her son and brought herself into the covenant and her son into the covenant and Moses was left alone by the Lord. Then Aaron met Moses in the wilderness and told and Moses told him everything that God had said. They went and spoke to the elders of Israel and the elders of Israel were glad to hear the news and they bowed and they worshipped and that's where we left the story last week. So what happens this week? This week Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh and say the Lord the God of Israel says let my people go. Pharaoh says who is the Lord? I don't know the Lord. In fact that comes over quite funny in Hebrew it's who is the Lord? I don't know the Lord. I don't know who I am is who I am. Which is it kind of sounds a bit weird in, in, in the Hebrew. It doesn't translate, but you get the idea. Why should I obey him and let Israel go? I will not let Israel go. Get back to work. And what's more, we're no longer going to supply you with straw. You go and find your own straw, make the same number of bricks, increase the burden. Pharaoh turns up the heat on the Hebrews. And the Hebrew, slave, uh, the Hebrew overseers, interesting that there seems to be a cadre of Hebrew overseers who uh, were in, uh, applying the slavery to the people, come out and say, why have you brought trouble on this people? You've not rescued, you've, you, you've not improved the situation, you've made things worse. So the Hebrew overseers complained to Moses, Moses goes and prays and complains to God, you haven't redeemed your people at all. The Lord repeats his uh, promise to release them and to take them to the promised land. But the Israelites cannot hear. They cannot listen to this. And Moses says, if the Israelites will not listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me? Pharaoh's hard, it's hard, he won't listen, and you're not listening either, God. So in today's passage, there seems to be an awful lot of not listening. And there's a subtle not listening, and it's the first one here, and it's that Moses is not listening carefully to God. Israel will not listen to Moses, Pharaoh won't listen to Moses, and the Lord appears not to be listening to Moses either. Why do I say there's a subtle not listening by Moses? <clears throat> In chapter 4, verse 18, the Lord says to Moses, the elders of Israel will listen to you, then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt. But in chapter 5, verse 1, Moses and Aaron go to the king of Egypt on their own, without the elders. In chapter 3, verse 20, the Lord says, I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians. Moses says to Pharaoh, let us go into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues. Moses has kind of got the message, but has either elaborated it or changed it, 
and has not carried out what the Lord asked him to do. It's not till chapter 7, verse 6, that we read, Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. There's a subtlety in the story that Moses is not quite doing the job he's been asked to do in the way that the Lord asked him to do it. Now last week we looked at the suffering of God's people. Today we're going to look at the, one of the consequences of suffering, the inability to listen. You see, Israel was too hurt to listen to Moses. In 6.9 it says, Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they didn't listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labour. And in 7.13 we read, Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would not listen to them, Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. Israel was too hurt to listen. Pharaoh was too hard-hearted to reach. Too hurt to listen, too hard-hearted to reach. So let's look at some of the consequences of suffering. Too hurt to listen. Their suffering was too great. The pain was so loud, they could not hear the voice of God. God had heard their groaning, but in their groaning, they could not hear God. Now we all carry pain and suffering of some degree or another. If it hasn't happened to you yet, just wait. But what do we do with our pain and suffering? We can transform it in several different directions. We can take our pain and we can alchemize it, we can change it into anger, rage, burning hatred, bitterness, complaining, grumbling, self-pity, why me, denial, denial's not just a river in Egypt, it's a state of refusing to accept how things are, doubt, depression, despair, retreat into isolation. I had a friend who got a terrible diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. And he retreated into his home and would accept no visitors over the five months until he died. He did not allow anyone close to him. He did not allow the people of God to share with him in his sufferings. He did not allow his brothers and sisters to serve him. He retreated into isolation. Some people turn their suffering into cruelty. They have become brutalized and become brutes. They become violent or they become accusing, accusing like Job's three friends. Job, things have happened to you because you must have sinned. We can take our suffering and turn it into something totally self-destructive and other people destructive. Or we can do something else with our suffering. We can turn it into worship. We can take our suffering and turn it into wisdom. We can take our suffering and turn it into, into, into lament, which is different from complaining. Complaining says, this isn't right, God. You don't have a right to do this to me. But lament says, Lord, you are Lord. How long? How long? 
Don't leave me. Perseverance is keeping on, keeping on, and maturity is not behaving like a little child and having spiritual tantrums. We can take our suffering and use it to strengthen one another and encourage one another. We have an option as to what we do with suffering. And the Israelites at the time were too hurt, too much in pain to listen to God. And they refused to hear the message of redemption and being taken to the promised land. So much for suffering. What do we do with our success? You see, Pharaoh was a successful man. He had an empire. He had slaves by the thousand. He built cities. He was successful. He had money, wealth and power. He had respect, he was at the top of his game and his heart became proud, hard to reach. Pharaoh's heart was hard. He would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. What do we do with our success? We can turn it into arrogance, conceit, or pride, let me just tease out the difference between those. Pride is the deceit of ownership. It's the voice within us that says, I own this. Conceit is the worship of self. And arrogance is the despising of others. We can take our success and turn it into attention-seeking behaviour and into the addiction of human praise. After all, to some degree, we are all approval junkies. As uh, one great preacher from the past said, when a lady came to him and said, what wonderful sermon. He said, yes, Satan told me that a few minutes ago. <laughs> Our success can turn into control freakery that we enslave other people to our particular way of doing things. It can give us a God complex that we somehow deserve and lap up all this praise. It can give us a sense of entitlement and it can give us a sense that we want to build something that's going to last to our glory, leave some pyramids, a sphinx, something behind us that will be to our praise and glory. I love the way that our Indian medical students so often start the conversation with praise the Lord or glory be to him. Keep on teaching us how to do that. You see, all these things deafen the soul so that we become hard-hearted and cannot listen. We cannot hear. Our sufferings can make us too hurt to listen. Our success can make us too proud to listen. One of the great conundrums of the book of Exodus is, is it, keeps on, it keeps on saying, 17 times it says, Pharaoh hardened his heart. The Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh's heart was hardened. The Lord made Pharaoh's heart hard. Who's doing the hardening? Pharaoh or God? It's a conundrum, but this is the bottom line. God is sovereign. We are responsible for our own actions and the judge of all the earth will do what is right. 
God is sovereign. We are responsible for our own actions. And the judge of all the earth will do is do what is right. Don't ask me to square that circle. I'm just telling you how it is, or at least how I see it is. Pharaoh comes under God's judgment because Pharaoh thinks that he is God. Pharaoh thinks he is God. He has the image of a God on his forehead. And Pharaoh's country is full of idols. They worship the Nile. They worship the frogs. They worship the night. They worship the weather. And one by one, as we go through the plagues next week, we will see how the great I Am says to Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt, Pharaoh, you are not God. And your gods are not gods. I am. I am that I am. But the tragedy is that Israel, although set free, became like Egypt and hardened their own hearts. Which brings us neatly to our New Testament passage, which we've had read for us. It's from the book of Hebrews, 1400 years after the time of the Exodus. And the writer to the book of Hebrews is saying, learn, let us learn from the past. Don't let us be like our ancestors who did not listen to God's promises. Their hearts became hardened like Pharaoh's. So our passage in Hebrews says, listen up. Listen up. See to it, verse 12 of Hebrews chapter 3, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Their tendency in the desert later on was to deviate from, from God's plan, to go a different way, to worship a golden calf, to say to Moses, was there an insufficient graves in Egypt that you brought us out into the desert to kill us here? They drifted away. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. And how we all do this. Listen up. Don't get hard-hearted, but encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. How we need to nail the lie that is inherent in every temptation. Go on. You know you You know you want to. You know... No, you don't want to. Go on, you know you'll take pleasure. No, you won't take pleasure in it because your pleasure will be surpassed by your grief and sadness. <coughs> Listen up. Hold on to the end. If we've come to share in Christ. Indeed, we hold our original conviction firmly to the end. This is what we need to do. Hold on. Listen up. And again, hold on. Listen up. Do not harden your hearts. Just as been said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. For listen up. The penalty is too great to bear. Don't perish in the wilderness, says the writer to the Hebrews. Don't disobey. Don't turn away. Don't turn back. Because they never entered into God's rest. Listening. Moses was kind of listening to God. 
The Israelites were too hurt to listen to the message. Pharaoh was too hard-hearted to listen to the message. And it appeared to Moses that God wasn't listening at all, but God was listening. He was trying to do it in his own way. Brothers and sisters, we worship a crucified, risen and glorified Saviour. And if there's one thing the Bible teaches, it's you become like what you worship. If you worship dumb idols, you become a dumb idol who has an eye but cannot see, has an ear that cannot hear, has a mouth that cannot speak, has feet that cannot walk, have hands that cannot do anything. But if you worship the living God in the person of the Lord Jesus, you become like him. And that is why we share in his sufferings. And that is why we are risen with him. We've died with Christ. We have been raised with Christ. The final resurrection has yet to happen and then we shall be glorified with Christ. So listen up. Let's turn our pain to praise. Let's turn our wounds to worship. Let's turn our agony into adoration. And let's turn our success into service. Listen up. Listen up. Let's pray. Lord, sometimes we can't hear you. Sometimes we can't hear you because we have disobeyed. Sometimes we can't hear you because our pain is so noisy. Sometimes we can't hear you because we are so proud. O oh, gracious God, who appeared to Elijah in a still, small voice, sharpen our ears, soften our hearts, so that we can hear you and respond to you out of the deepest adoration. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.